Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. Today's guest is probably a familiar name and face to many of us who are parents. Rachel Coops has been a long-time presenter on Play School, having graced the stage and screen for thousands of ecstatic toddlers for many years now. But she's also an award-winning storyteller working across many forms, writing, acting and producing for international screen and stage for more than two decades. While storytelling is her career, yoga is actually her passion. In 2004, she was awarded the Martin Bequest Travelling Scholarship and the Ian Potter Cultural Trust to study in Paris with Philippe Gaulier, mentor and teacher to Sasha Baron Cohen. Rachel has also starred in Australia's most loved dramas such as The Secret Life of Us and McLeod's Daughters and has written award-winning theatre. Her latest book is out and it's called Paris for Beginners and it's published by Affirm Press. And her previous book, Find Your Strength, focused on her story of navigating her life as a solo parent. Oh, as an interesting aside, Rachel and I actually went to boarding school over 30 years ago and in a spooky coincidence, I also lived for some time in Paris in my far more hedonistic 20s, which is one of my greatest memories and remains still my favourite city. So welcome to the politics of everything, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Amber. Go to zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use my code, the politics of everything, 30, all one word, and you'll get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. I want you to have the same easy experiences I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. I feel like I know this answer because I did go to school with you, but I've never really asked you as an adult, do you recall what you wanted to be when you were a kid? Did you want to be an actor or something else? And just tell us a little bit about your early career for those of us who may not be familiar with it. So you may not remember, but there was a big phase where I wanted to be a nun. In the no! Phase. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I totally wanted to be a nun. I think there was something about the, 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 sacredness of how they all walked around quietly and something about churches that probably you know meditation Rachel in later years was always seeking but yeah I wanted to be a nun and then that phase passed uh, probably year nine year nine or ten and uh, I I don't think I ever thought I would have acting as a career to be honest I, I felt like it was a hobby that I might do in the longer run but I loved economics. I thought that it would be sensible to have a career in business. And I wanted to do something in media communications, but in the, in, in the more kind of the realm of the business side. So not just the creative side, but bringing that creative and business together. Now, I might have gone through a phase of wanting to be a vet at some point, <laughs> uh, just for my love of Still time. <laughs> But definitely, yeah, what what I, I guess, quite far from where I ended up. Absolutely. And did you study at uni? Did you end up studying and kind of doing something sensible? I did. So when I left school, I did an economic, well, I started doing commerce law and very quickly within a matter of weeks realised that law was not what I pictured it was and ended it's up nothing doing, like LA law, I swear to goodness. Nothing like Not really as LA fun as that. Law, nothing <laughs> like debating at school. Uh, so I ended up doing an economics degree. But while I was at uni doing economics, I did my first professional acting jobs, which kind of put me through uni. Wow, that's amazing. Mm. Um, so to touch on the topic of today, which is, of course is all about Paris, the greatest city in the world as far as I'm concerned, sorry, Sydney, don't come close. Mm. Um, you know, last year you actually decided to do something pretty wild, I reckon, for most of us parents. You know, the borders had reopened finally in Australia and your son was obviously able to spend some time with his other side of the family and you went in this solo holiday to Paris, but, of course, not as a 20-something but as a mature age woman, if you like, a middle-aged mm. woman. What was your goal in actually 
doing this or was it much more open-ended than that? Did you have an intention behind wanting to go back? It's so funny that you say it's quite a radical thing because I don't think that I realised what a radical thing it was. It's only now that I'm talking about it so much with the book coming out that a lot of parents like, oh my God, you had two weeks by yourself. What was that like? How did you manage it? And I'm like, wow, we really do not prioritize that for ourselves, do we? So that's been a very interesting reflection for me, I guess, just that for me, it happened like so many of us at the end of those very strange couple of years and solo parenting lock two lockdowns, uh, I was pretty, and I had a, a, quite a, a big health scare at the end of that second lockdown. So I sort of came out, it was like, Merry Christmas, here comes Omicron, don't get COVID because you've got a 5.2 centimetre tumour in your left humerus and we're going to have to watch it quite closely. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Oh, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> that's too much. I mean, we all have our own PTSD from that period, but it does sound like that was an extra load. Yeah, I think it was because we came out and and that was on the tail end of it. And that was December, January. And I found out by February that I wouldn't have to have surgery then. And we were, we were going to watch and scan and wait and see over the next couple of years to see how slowly it grew and what it does. And so by, I'd actually booked a ticket then in December with this fantasy of going to Paris, mainly because borders weren't open and there were so many frequent flyer tickets available to Paris, which is never the case. No. Wow. And I hadn't been back since Gabriel was born. So 10 years of solo parenting, two years of lockdowns, this health scare. And I thought, do you know what, if I am fit and well enough, I didn't even know what was going to happen, whether I was going to be having surgery or going through chemo or what the story was going to be. I thought, now is the moment to do it if I can. If I can't and I have to, you know, come February, I have to have surgery, then great, I won't go. If borders don't open, I won't go. And of course, even in the lead up, I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to go because everyone was getting COVID again. I know. And I, I thought, am I going to make it? Gosh, you must have wanted to put yourself in some solitary confinement just to make sure you didn't get sick before you had to leave. Well, I'd done that for so long when I got my diagnosis. December and January, I was in a proper bubble. And so I think by the time I knew that I wasn't having surgery, I was like hell, a free-for-all. I just needed to actually have a little bit of, of a life. And also I had my, my first book launch the week before I left. And literally I had that moment when everyone started to walk in the doors. I thought, am I going to hug anyone? I was like, yeah, what? what do we do now? What do we do now? <laughs> And 80 people I hugged and, and I I didn't get COVID. I actually didn't get it until January this year. So it took me it took me a while. Um, but I, I made it to Paris and it was only once I got there that I realized I had this kind of dark night of the soul, I guess you can call it, or anxiety, this midlife crisis of just going, oh my God, who am I? Who am I now? Who wh- where have I been? What's happened? How, where did the past 20 years go and where am I going? And I didn't anticipate that. I, yeah. I don't know what I thought would happen. <laughs> I, think I, I thought I'd go back and I'd see, see my old friends and I knew I wanted to write something about that time when I lived there and I thought it would be a joyous experience. And it was, but it was also a, a profound kind of self-introspection, self-reflection, taking stock time. And I, the number of women who've said to me, oh, well, I couldn't do that, you know, I couldn't take two weeks or, or it wouldn't be possible. And I'm like, why do we have this story in our head that it's not important enough for us to take two weeks? I know it's nothing, particularly <gasps> in the scheme of our whole lives, which you obviously have great perspective on because, you know, you've been able to do this thing. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think for a lot of people, it will probably, um, there'll be lots of uh, flights over to Paris once people read this book and realise that, you know, there's there's a version of that in them as well that they maybe yeah. haven't even tapped into because they've been mothers or they've been career people or they've just been, you know, bogged down with the day to day, which I think is what most of us think our life needs to look like all the time to be mm. honest. And so mm. it's very um, it's very bold to be able to do that. So for anyone who's not been to Paris, 
how would you describe it? Like you see it in movies and you see the postcards and all the sort of stereotypical images. But for you personally, is there a certain way that you feel like it feels, that it smells? What does it really represent for you? And, you know, when you, you stepped off the plane and into that space, was it the same as you remember it? It's the same in some ways, but like the world has changed and we've changed through the past few years and Paris has changed. And there's there's elements of the city that I don't think will ever change and the spirit, you know, that revolutionary kind of spirit and the socialist core. But even that was interesting to watch that getting a little bit rattled because there is more and more polarity in and more and more globalisation in, I guess, not just politics but the way everything is done so for example there was a massive street that kind of it it guts the center of Paris called Rue de Rivoli you know where the Louvre is and it's now just pedestrian only and buses and you know when I was there 10 years ago there when there was no such thing as Uber Eats and now it's all those you know Uber Eat kind of bikes And so it's no longer, I always thought you were going to have this city that's still a real working dynamic city because you had that major thoroughfare of traffic. You could cross Paris along Rue de Rivoli through the tourists, but you also got all the the working life. And now it is, yeah, it's sort of like a a mall with, and it's great for the environment. And and there's so many positive aspects to the, the change of how French are thinking, right, because they weren't hugely aware of any of the, I guess, the in Sydney and in LA, for example, we always had, well, I always had this awareness from a very young age of, and maybe it's because we've had bushfires and we grow up with climate being in front of us, but there was none of that in Paris last time. No. This time I even had a French friend saying, I'd love to come to Australia, but I wouldn't fly commercial because of the carbon print and I'm like oh so that like he would never have said that to me 17 years ago yeah all I was people smoked everywhere in Paris even when even when I was living in London and nobody was allowed to smoke they would I was it was quite and and fairly introspective city that's how I always saw Paris you know from a you know they didn't want to have a McDonald's in every corner they Uber Eats those things obviously didn't exist when I lived there but the versions of that were very few and far between and I suppose the globalisation aspect was something that I always felt like Parisians particularly staved off, you know, even speaking English for them was, you know, well, why would we do that? Yeah, and there is a lot of, there is like corners and pockets that are staving it off, but I think the reality is now everywhere you go in the world are the same shops. And that was a bit gutting to, it used to be really special to walk through the Marais and you go to these boutiques that you can only go to when you're in the Marais, but now you can find Vanessa Bruno all over the world or you can find like all the little the little shops, which is, it's just life now. It's not that I, I find it super depressing. I just was shocked because like you say, I thought that Paris was going to be sort of the last bastion, like New York in some ways. There's parts of New York that I hope, I haven't been back in the past 10 years either, but I hope that there's parts of that because I always picture New York, New York as being the same you know you can rely on it always having those really unsafe buildings and the fire escapes <laughs> out the back and totally you know get, I can go to Cat, Cat Stelly and get a Reuben sandwich there are things that you just rely on right yes yeah. you rely on those big cities not changing but I guess this is this is life and there were aspects to the the politi- political life to the social life to the commercial life that were yeah really different but at the same time yes it is an introspective city and I love that you use that word because I think it's introspective in the sense that the first thing I loved when I moved there was there's no small talk there is no small talk in Paris (laughs) apart from you have to say bonjour when you enter a shop yes hello outside of that you you go straight into depth of conversation and that's just the way my brain has always been wired 
And I used to feel a little bit like an outsider in a lot of places, particularly in my 20s, you know, particularly when I was younger in Sydney. I, I've never felt attached to Sydney. I love living here. Yes, I'm grateful we live in Sydney. Yeah, I'm, I'm very similar. That's that's probably, it's interesting. It's like, I feel like, yeah, you've got that that in you as well. I've always said that to people. They're like, oh, but Sydney and it's beaches and it's beautiful and it's this and you don't have any, anything like it. It's like, yeah, but it's not my spirit city. It's not the mm-hmm. place where I it lights me up. It's familiar and I'm grateful, but I don't, I'm not in love with it. Does that make sense? Yes. And I think the thing about uh, Paris is that what I love about it is that there's no, it's not this glossy surface that you see the beautiful buildings and the Paris that the shiny postcard Paris, but as soon as you get there, you also see the, the dirty Paris. It's impossible not to see it. Hmm. Whereas I feel, and, and you have to work hard for friendships in Paris, but once you make friends and when you really see all the darker side, you fall in love with that as well. And you're, you're a friend for life and you're, I've got friends there who I know are the most loyal, incredible people in my life. Whereas their experience of coming to Sydney, for example, is you make friends very quickly, but there is a, you can only get to a certain level because it's hard to make really deep friendships as a foreigner here. And I hadn't thought of that until. No, well, we, could, we don't view it like that because it's not our, not our experience. Mm. And the other thing I would say I love about Paris is that, and from the very first time when I first moved there, I stayed in this tiny apartment and I got bitten by bed bugs. And just for anyone that's thinking it's all going to be glamour and uh, for anyone thinking opening it's night parties and, and you yeah. know, Montmartre and all that stuff. Yeah, and it's absolutely not. And, you know, taking my blood-stained sheets to the, the laundromat on the way to catch a train down to a party in the south of France. But then you get to the train station, and I talk about this in the book, and you're like, one minute, you know, you're washing blood, a bed bug blood off your sheets, but the next minute you're in a train station that is so beautiful you want to cry. <laughs> yeah, it's very it's very juxtaposing. I think that's important to realize about any place. It's not perfection doesn't make it an amazing city. It's actually the the realities which you're kind of unpacking for us. So obviously, you know, 20 odd years ago when you got the opportunity to move there it was for a professional reason. You you obviously won this traveling scholarship and you were able to go there. Do you remember if you cast your mind back to then, so not this trip, but the first trip, your your preconceived notions of what you thought it was going to be like, you know, that idea of all the high fashion transport strikes is something we all know about. Mm-hmm. And obviously things like open air cheese markets and, and you know, buying fresh food daily and all those sorts of things. Was that something that you thought, no, I'll just see what it's like or had you done some research? Do you remember going into it blind or were you just kind of, you know, open for whatever was going to happen? I had done no research. Uh, I'd done six months at Alliance Francaise. So oh, yeah. <laughs> We've all done that. In French, which I still have the most poor in French. Oh, me too. Um, I, when I was five, I told my nan I wanted to live. In, I was going to live in Paris one day. And the only dots I could connect for that was that I, we learned French at preschool. And I, and I still remember the words and the pictures from when I was at preschool. So it must have been a formative experience those French classes. I remember Papillon, you know, like the butterfly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I went back a few times, once with my sister. She won a one, remember in the old days we used to watch music videos on Saturday and they would have oh, that's, competitions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So my sister, who is an incredible writer, she was a journalist, now a doctor, she wrote in 25 words or less why she should meet Boyzone uh, ah. at their concert in Japan. And she won and my stepmother tripped down the stairs before she was meant to go. So I was going to be her chaperone, barely a teenager myself. And then at the last minute they cancelled their Japan tour and went to Paris. So we ended up in Paris again and had this really formative experience together. And then I went as a, 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 a traveller with friends and I just remember sitting on a balcony and one of the girl's brothers lived with a French girl and we were in her tiny apartment. They're all so tiny. The bathrooms used to freak me out. That's one thing I, you know, in those apartments, just it's more like a like a cupboard. Yeah, it's like with, a With cupboard. a shower curtain and the whole thing gets wet. Yeah. 
But it's kind of what makes it though, isn't it? Because it's and you're mopping so... up the floor because it's like it's a trip hazard, right? I know, but it's all part of it. Like there's a part of me that just loves that aspect of it that you you know there's a there's sacrifice yeah. you want to be in Paris. it's the impracticality that I love about yes I lived there for six months and we lived on like the top floor with all your groceries going up this spiral staircase no lift mm. like boiling hot in summer freezing cold in winter but I kind of loved it yes but I, but I completely whinge here and want to put the central heating on <laughs> yes and that's the thing. I feel like there's some. That's what it does. It, it there is the trade off. Is you go. I will. I will walk up the staircase because I don't know why, but this place is my it makes my spirit so happy. Uh, you know, and I think that's the. Some people have it, and some people have it for London. Some people have it for many different countries that. They don't even, they're like, I don't know why I feel so connected to this place. I just do. I get there and I feel like, oh, my God, this is my happy place. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess for you, you've found that and you've been able to go back. Yeah. So that expat experience, obviously, you have come, you came back after that period of time. How do you think that sort of altered your influence, your career, and even you personally and how you view yourself and your place in the world as a result of that experience? I think it probably, and you just asking me that makes me feel guilty like I wish I'd brought more of it back with me I wish I'd brought more of the the having dinner parties on a Friday night and the catching up with friends regularly for apéro, you know for an aperitif on your way home from work with a, a plate of crudite raw veg and I, I wish I did more of that the Parisian kind of things but I don't where I do think it it has definitely stuck is that I have a lot of friends who are expats and interestingly my son has been drawn to people who are expats as well and I wonder if that's just because you know you have that sensibility for or an understanding of what it must be like to be here without all your family and um, making your way in a culture that isn't necessarily yours. And I think I also have a, a fascination and a desire to be around difference. I don't want to just, like, you know, I know my my life and my culture and my heritage and and it's probably from a place of privilege, to be honest, where I'm lucky enough that I go, oh, yeah, I, I can always come back here, but I would also love to know every aspect of other people's way of doing things and through friendship it's such a beautiful way to do that right and I, I've learned so much about the Parisian sensibility not from the place but from my friendships from the people. Absolutely and the people make the place and I think that could be the connection you have even when you're not there so I want to ask you obviously having come back you know almost a year ago from your last trip to Paris how was returning to if you like normal life did you find it more jarring or easier to sort of reconcile Rachel in Paris and Rachel in Sydney because I guess less routine when you're away it's all a bit of a fantasy it's you know two weeks of your life is there ways in which you try to keep some of that Parisian magic this time around? Absolutely I like just to start with and this sounds so ridiculous but I feel like I lost my pleasure for dressing like for putting clothes on and for, for remembering who I am, you know, my sense of my, I used to love uh, going shopping and finding a really nice pair of jeans and a cute shirt. And, and I lost that. I totally lost it. And after being back in Paris and going to the little boutiques and going to the secondhand stores over there, I regained a bit of joy for that. Such a silly thing, but almost that pleasure of of dressing up and, and getting up in the morning and wanting to, because I live I live in activewear, particularly because I practice every day. I'll often put activewear on. Well, you have a good excuse. It's not like I a lot know. of people don't even have that. They don't even work uh, out. But it's so bad. It's so like, I don't know. It's, I, it's, I, it's, it's, I think it's also become accepted in in where we are. And did you find in Paris, I am curious to ask you this, Did you are people into activewear in Paris or are no. we still in our Chanel ballet flats and flea yeah. market cardigans? And Yeah, everyone is in jean, like the uniform. And I think that's the other thing that I feel like I 
because I we don't we don't make that effort to get a cute pair of sneakers and a cute pair of ballet flats and some mm. good jeans and a night a couple of nice shirts. I just don't do that in Sydney. But it is pretty simple. There's a simplicity. Oh, to I play. love the simplicity. Yeah. I love that style. It's just it's, it's really so cool. But it's quite wearable as well. I think we just go for what everyone else is kind of wearing as well, which is the active wear, particularly if you're living in a a city which is you know like Sydney and you do do a lot of walking and so forth. But um, yeah, no, I was just curious to see whether the fashion had evolved and globalized if you like it's the same it's the same and I really I think I when I got back to I was I kept that bit of joy and that bit of god life is short and I need to have more pleasure and I need to see my friends and I need to have a relationship with my friends here because life gets busy and you don't see each other unless you're going to your parents' funeral or Yeah, you like mentioned that. that in an article and I was like, oh, that's quite true. Or my school reunion this year. Or school reunions. I you know. know, I think online is great, but we don't need to live our lives online. I think that's what I've realised. I, I just think we've lost the art of, and the French know how to live. They know how to live. They don't work to live. They're their whole life, the weekends there, there is a, this, the city feels totally different because there is this agreement that everyone participates in leisure for the weekend. And so, without guilt and without taking your laptop yes. to the cafe. And without like racing between five different sports or we're just, I don't know, we have this, and I'm part of it. I'm saying yeah. when I'm, I'm wound <laughs> up in it. I'm, you know, uber mum at sports all weekend too. But there is this, agreement between all the parents and all the kids and all the families of like we also just go to the art gallery as a family and go to a long lunch together and I really I've kept that like I've kept trying to do more fun stuff we went to more live shows this year Gabriel and I we've I'm just trying to do more fun nice things instead of life just being work activities and then trying to get to sleep every night with, you know, melatonin and winding down from a crazy day. Like it shouldn't be like that. Yeah. So I have kept that. I've kept the uh, the trying to um, participate in what should be, you know, fundamentally part of our lives, which is leisure and joy and pleasure. Absolutely. Changing tack a little bit, I do ask my guests some pretty standard questions. And one of those is, what's the best advice that you've ever been given and why? It doesn't have to be professional. It could be personal. Oh, this is such a hard question. So my teacher, Manorama, she's my yoga teacher, she's my Sanskrit teacher who I've had for many, many years, says has said two things to me that have, I guess, are like my mantras. I use them very often. One is pade pade, which means step by step or, you know, one foot in front of the other because I was, I'm always in such a rush to, to do things and I want to know things now and I used to be very impatient. So that's been really fundamental in me just learning to go, you, you do this thing and then the next thing and then the next thing and that's enough. <laughs> and the other one is what could I learn from this I could learn in no other way? And she I said that, that in the very first training I did with her, which is like 14, 15 years ago. And I wrote it down and I, I've remembered it ever since. And she talked about it in the context of nursing her mum as she was in her final years of, her final days of, you know, dying in a tiny apartment in New York and caring for her. And she was like, God, what is the point of this? You know, <laughs> And she said, her teacher had always said, what can I learn from this? I can learn in no other way. So that's my other big mantra, especially when I'm in a sticky place or I'm frustrated or I don't know why something's happening or I'm feeling a little bit like things are not fair. I'm like, I may not understand this now, but at some point I'm going to learn something from this experience. (laughs) Yeah, totally. I think most of us can relate to that once we've had some life experiences under our belt. If we spoke in a year's time, what would be your number one goal to have achieved and why? And obviously it's not to write a book about Paris because you've already done that. (laughs) I would like to, because I'm a crazy person, I would like to, (laughs) I have a few books in my head. Oh my goodness, here we go. Um, I would like to have, have, be publishing the next one by this time next year which is mental but also possible because it's the way my brain works. And 
I'd like the, I'm developing the book as a series. And so I would like to be somewhere in the process of that. Probably wouldn't be getting made yet, but definitely along the stages, along that road. Are we thinking like we had Emily in Paris, we're going to have Rachel in Paris? But if you read the book, it's kind of the antithesis. I know, but I did love that show, even though I know why people didn't. <laughs> oh, I, lo- I love the show. But my book is, I, I think, the opposite in terms yeah. of, you know, it's not glamorous. And as you would know, the real Paris is not, it's not glamorous and it's not glossy. There is, and especially going to theatre school and the most brutal, infamous clown school in the world. In a I, Even of- saying clown school makes me laugh. It's weird. <laughs> I know, but clown school is no joke. Let me tell you. (laughs) There's a bumper sticker for you. As we wrap up today, what would be your final takeaway message for us listening on the politics of Parisian life? Learn the rules. If you know the rules, if you know the Parisian rules, you will be fine. Excellent. And buy the book, of course. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you, Rachel, for the first time in probably about 30 years. But uh, if you do want to connect further with Rachel, there will be some details of her professional Instagram and some details about the book on the show notes. So until next time, take care. Thank you. Thanks, Amber. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify, and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea, you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.